Hello there. To cope is to make a specific alteration, either mentally, emotionally, or physically, that allows you to manage or adapt to a situation that is causing you stress. A coping mechanism is a process, a procedure, or a technique that enables you to do just that, to manage or adapt to stress. Some examples of coping mechanisms are addictive behaviors like cutting, binging, smoking, gambling, denial, humor, attacking, regressing, overcompensation, humility, self-blaming, avoidance, dissociation, positive focus, escaping into movies, books, or imagination, intellectualization, distancing, disconnection, falling asleep, passive aggression, projection, repression, and substitution, to name literally just a few. Stress is serious business. A person cannot thrive very long in an atmosphere of distress. In fact, the minute that you introduce distress into somebody's life, their well-being immediately declines. So it's obvious why we'd want to escape from that as fast as we possibly can. And we do this through coping mechanisms. However, what we often find is that the very coping mechanism which enabled us to escape from that situation or to adapt to or manage the stress in our lives creates problems for us in our future. The very thing which enabled us to feel better then is now absolutely prohibiting our capability of feeling happiness, creating happiness, or creating the life that we want. So often, we couldn't actually change the situation in our life that was causing us stress or distress. This is especially true in childhood, when we didn't really call the shots in our life, the people around us did. So what are you supposed to do, obviously, if you can't get out, get away from something that's causing you distress? You have to manage it, or you have to find a way to adapt to it. This is the birth of coping mechanisms. Many of these coping mechanisms, they served us to begin with. They enabled us to continue surviving in an atmosphere where we were challenged with our very survival. We encountered something that was super distressing. It was about to destroy our well-being. We were about to dead end, but we continued with the expansion by engaging in that coping mechanism. But lo and behold, what we find is the very thing we used to cope and to continue to expand in childhood, quite often in the future, becomes the very reason we can't expand. It becomes a detriment instead of a benefit. For example, the dissociation that was a coping mechanism for a young girl to escape incest now makes it impossible for her as an adult to feel fear. So she engages in highly risky and self-destructive behaviors. Also, here we are in the spiritual field where you constantly hear all these analogies about the elephants that are tied to these tiny tree trunks when they're babies. And when they're adults, they don't even realize that they're strong enough to pull them right out of the ground because they have been trained to see themselves as powerless. Our coping mechanisms work exactly the same way. We got ourselves into distress. We couldn't resolve the distress. And so we found a way to cope our way out of it. That coping mechanism basically causes us to escape. But lo and behold, in adulthood, we may very well be in a situation that is quite easy to remedy, but we don't know it. Instead, we're still aligned with that idea that we're powerless, and so instead of doing anything to change it, we simply engage in our old patterns of our coping mechanisms. I know you have a friend in your life where you're thinking, oh my god, that's totally them. Or it's so easy from my perspective to see how they could just get out of it immediately, and yet they continue to engage in the same avoidance behavior. It could be said that some coping mechanisms are healthy and other coping mechanisms are not healthy, but I will tell you that this is a matter that's seriously up for debate, because the majority of coping mechanisms that we think are healthy are in fact not healthy at all. And this is where I'm going to burst your bubble. The spiritual field is an absolute minefield when it comes to coping mechanisms. Why is that? 
because so many spiritual beliefs, spiritual truths, spiritual philosophies, and spiritual practices serve as a justification for your coping mechanisms. If not that, they quite literally in and of themselves are coping mechanisms. To make this more clear, the ego, looking to get out of its distress, will select a spiritual belief and a spiritual teacher who enables, validates, or creates the coping mechanism. The ego has hijacked your spiritual practice so as to stay out of pain. I want you to take a look at what got you into spirituality. Chances are, it was you feeling some form of distress or discomfort. There's nothing wrong with this. For the majority of us, suffering was the doorway to enlightenment. It's the most popular door that people take. However, if distress or discomfort was your reason for getting into spirituality, that means your entire spiritual practice is ripe for coping mechanisms. In other words, if the whole reason we open the door to spirituality is because we're in distress, it means the shadow we may need to face is that our entire spiritual practice may be one giant coping mechanism. And there is potential with any coping mechanism that we're engaged in that a behavior is more detrimental to us and those around us than it is good for us and those around us. The Positive Focus Law of Attraction community is one example of a spiritual practice community that is ripe for coping mechanisms. The beliefs and methodologies and practices that are involved in this particular community are ripe for the coping mechanisms of bypassing and denial, two of the most dangerous coping mechanisms in existence. So naturally, people who are prone to denial, they will find themselves gravitating towards the positive focus law of attraction communities. Another example is asceticism. Okay, so obviously asceticism opens the door wide open for coping mechanisms like self-harm. So naturally, people who are prone to self-harm as a coping mechanism will find themselves drawn to the spiritual practice of asceticism. So why is it so hard to let go of coping mechanisms? Because they don't cause us pain on the front end. In fact, they serve to get us out of pain. It's instant gratification. So our subconscious mind puts them in the good-for-me category. After all, we are wired to avoid pain. So just like we see with most addictions, in the beginning, we're convinced we don't have a problem. We don't see that it's not benefiting us. In fact, it's getting us out of our pain. Sometimes it takes years for us to realize, oh my gosh, not only has this not gotten me away from the pain, it's just suppressed it all. I've now added more pain to pain. So now I'm basically homeless on top of all the pain I was trying to escape from to begin with. It's only when we see this back-end price for our addiction that we wake up with our awareness to the realization that our coping mechanism is a problem that is hurting us and the people around us. We justify our coping mechanisms and defend them to the death until this point. So as I said, the most difficult thing about trying to get over your coping mechanisms is that they don't cause you pain up front. And pain is what alerts us to the fact that there's a problem. So obviously if we're not feeling the pain because we're coping our way out of it, then we don't actually see that there is a problem. Why would we try to fix something that's not a problem? The only things we're motivated to work on and let go of are problems that cause us pain. It's easy to directly deal with and resolve a trigger because a trigger hurts. But what about resolving something that doesn't directly hurt and doesn't register in our conscious mind as a problem, even though it is a problem and does lead to pain? Here are some suggestions for how to let go of your coping mechanisms. Step one, we have to re-own pain and start to actually befriend it. We have to move in the direction of pain instead of away from it. Now, there's an interesting little mechanism that happens in those of us who engage in coping mechanisms. It's that we have made pain the enemy. We essentially found ourselves in a situation where we couldn't really do anything about the threat itself. And so we turned our attention to the secondary threat, which was the pain itself. We mistook that, or I should say lumped it in completely, with the original threat. We made it all one thing. And then we convinced ourselves that as long as we were away from the pain, we were away from the threat. We started to see pain in and of itself as the threat to our life. 
In reality, pain is not a threat to us at all, quite the opposite. It is a feedback mechanism. It tells us information about our environment and ourselves so we can take appropriate action. So you can understand what I mean on a deeper level, I'm going to paint you a picture. Let's pretend that your arm was just cut off. Now, let's pretend that you just injected yourself with morphine, so you didn't feel it anymore. So then you said, oh, thank God, because I don't feel the pain, it's no longer a threat. Now, I could, from my perspective, stand there and say, um, actually, the real threat is the fact that you're bleeding out. And just the fact that you don't feel what's going on doesn't actually mean you're okay. A coping mechanism is like emotional morphine. Improper usage, and you could have an even bigger problem on your hands than the original threat. Pain is not your enemy. It is absolutely perfect feedback. And I know that if you're one of these people who just cannot stand discomfort, it's easy to feel really threatened, like if you go towards the pain or embrace the pain or start to learn from the pain or sink into it, that you're going to be stuck there forever. But that is not the way that feelings work. Feelings only work that way if you resist them. Whenever you find yourself in pain, I want you to train yourself that any kind of pain is like a meditation bell that is going off, saying, ding, 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 this is your opportunity to settle into the pain instead of to resist it. Basically, the pain is awakening you to the opportunity to gain valuable feedback. It is trying to tell you something. If you engage in your coping mechanism to get away from it, you'll never know what it's trying to tell you, so you'll never be able to take the right action for yourself or the people around you. Two, I want you to take a look at the things that make you feel better. Make an entire list of these things. What do you do when you are in a state of distress? Now I want you to take on the perspective of being a transcendental lawyer or a philosopher. And it's your job to argue how those ways of basically decreasing stress or feeling better are detrimental to you. How could each one be a coping mechanism? If each one was a coping mechanism, what potential downsides could there be to that coping mechanism? How does each one not work? By doing this exercise, we can become aware of some of our coping mechanisms. We can also open our minds wide enough to see the potential shadow side of our strategies, including every spiritual truth we have become attached to. By doing this, we are less likely to succumb to the tool so that it uses us instead of us using it. Awareness of the coping mechanism you do have is priceless. After all, it is the primary agent for change. So, if you want to take on the perspective of a philosopher, how might these ways of feeling better not really serve you? If you want to take on a transcendental lawyer, you're going to basically argue for the fact that those things are causing you hell instead of heaven. 3. Take a look at online lists of coping mechanisms that the mainstream community or even the alternative community, is aware of currently. I want you to look for the ones that you yourself engage in. I want you to think about how each one benefits you and how each one is detrimental. Another way of putting this is, looking at this coping mechanism that I can pretty much see that I have, how does that give to me? What does it give to me? And what does it take away from me? Also, relative to the ones that you don't really relate to, meaning you can't recognize that in yourself, I want you to think about whether you have somebody in your life that does use that coping mechanism. It's really important that we become more aware of these coping mechanisms in general, because it's the awareness that allows us to see when they come up in the present moment in real time, either in ourselves or in other people in our life. Four, you have to undo the coping mechanism. The same place that it began or first occurred, which is in your past. It may seem ironic, but trauma is resolved in the very same way that your coping mechanisms for trauma is resolved. It's resolved through trauma integration. Essentially, we were in a situation long ago that caused us so much stress that we learned to cope in that specific way. What we have to do is to go back to that original trauma and to teach ourselves a different way of coping. And also, to rescue ourselves away from the original stressor. When you have a coping mechanism that you're feeling inclined to engage in or are currently engaged in, close your eyes and imagine not engaging in it instead. Perhaps you have someone in your life who knows you well enough to know your control or coping mechanisms. 
have this person tell you, okay, right now you're engaged in X coping mechanism behavior. What would happen if you engaged in X, the opposite of that coping mechanism? And I want you to go into that. So basically the coping mechanism wants to take you right. And instead you're going to see what's so bad about going left. That's going to anchor you into the pain that's attached to the original trauma, which in fact created that coping mechanism to begin with. So for example, if you feel like binge eating, close your eyes and imagine not doing it. What would be so bad about not binging? See if you can feel the pain that you're trying to get away from through binging. Sink into that pain where it lives in your body and ask yourself, when was the first time I felt this exact same feeling and coped by eating? Instead of looking for the answer, let whatever memory that needs to surface, surface. And now you have your opportunity for resolution. You can make the memory of visualization whereby you can help your past self to escape the distressing circumstance and learn a different way to cope other than the way that they decided to cope. Using the binging example, perhaps you find that you were five years old and you had a controlling parent who made you feel out of control of yourself, so the only control you did have was over food. You could see this child self at five years old in this painful experience. Re-experience the terror and powerlessness of being out of control. Validate those feelings as correct to feel given the circumstance, and then take action to help the child feel more empowered by, for example, defending the child against the controlling parent, taking the child to a safe place, and then explaining anything you want to to them about food so the inner child no longer feels the desire to cope in that way. After doing this process, you will most likely notice yourself not engaging in the coping mechanism. I have designed a process it's called the completion process, and it is designed specifically to unhook you from these past traumas, including the ones that created your coping mechanisms. So if you want to learn about this process and you want to dive into doing it, then you can buy the book, The Completion Process, anywhere books are sold, because it explains this process in detail, so there is absolutely no doubt in your mind that you know how to do it. Or you can visit www.thecompletionprocess.com. Five, this step is going to be really confusing to some of you, but I promise you it works. When you notice yourself becoming ready to, about to, engage in one of your coping mechanisms, and you feel that first hit of awareness like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this again, choose to do it consciously. I mean really, like 100% choose to do it instead of not to do it. I'm aware that I'm about to shoot up. I'm going to choose to do it anyways. What's really, really important for those of us that are engaged in coping mechanisms, especially ones that are subconscious and feel almost as if you have no impulse control, is that you become aware and familiar with that sense of personal freedom of choice. After you do this a few times, so you can see that you can actually choose to do it even when you're aware of it, the next time, choose to do something else, an alternative behavior, something you think would be more beneficial than detrimental to you. I want you to do this several times with several techniques. Try anything you can, trying to find an alternative to the one coping mechanism that you've currently been using. Now look, you've got nothing to lose. Why? Because if none of them work, you can go right back to the original coping mechanism, so you really don't lose anything. Six, I want you to practice the art of softening instead of tensing in response to discomfort. If we use coping mechanisms, we have learned to tense against discomfort. In fact, all a coping mechanism really is, is a behavior that's the result of tensing against discomfort or pain. Basically, releasing or softening into discomfort is the absolute ultimate checkmate move when it comes to pain. So when you feel that discomfort, I want you to close your eyes and imagine literally becoming completely soft and allowing of that sensation in your body. Imagine your muscles relaxing, send your cells the message to open up, start breathing into it completely so you feel yourself going completely limp against the discomfort. If we can go soft, instead of becoming tense against discomfort, we can not only learn from the discomfort, we have an opportunity to choose not to engage in our coping mechanism. Whatever we resist persists. If you tense against pain, you are resisting the pain. And like I said, coping mechanism is nothing but a resistance to pain, which is why when you're engaged in a coping mechanism, you end up with more pain ultimately in the long run than the original pain you were trying to escape from.
We all want to find solutions to our problems so that our life feels good instead of bad. There is nothing inherently wrong with its desire. We'd be in denial, in fact, if we didn't admit that this is what we're after. But pain is not a threat. It is a feedback mechanism that is alerting us to a threat. We would do better to proactively explore options for transforming the actual threat in our life rather than treat pain that's a response to the threat in our life as if it itself is the threat to the degree that we engage in all these coping mechanisms to try to escape from the pain. After all, a life that is lived coping is no life at all. Have a good week. Thank you.